Hello, my guest is Karen Fiorito. She is a vegan artist and activist. She's a participating artist with Art of Compassion, an international group of vegan artists. She is the exhibitions chair for the Los Angeles Printmaking Society and is president of Got Drought. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's talk first about your commitment to not just vegetarianism, but you go full force. No animal product whatsoever because you truly believe that animals are creating so many problems, creating methane, using too much water. Why have you switched to a vegan diet and why do you believe more people need to? I believe that one of the most important choices that we can make as an individual is our food choices and, and what we eat and what we buy, especially what we buy, anything we buy, our clothing, our furniture, all of that. The animal agriculture and factory farming and the fur trade and all of that contributes to environmental damage, but it also tortures billions and billions of animals a year, a waste water. There are so many alternatives now to meat, dairy, cheese, fake fur. I don't think there's really an excuse anymore not to be vegan. The way climate change is um, happening at a rapid pace. We are basically facing the sixth mass extinction in our history and nobody's talking about it. The media is not talking about it. The government's not talking about it. They don't want us to be informed. They don't want us to go vegan. It would destroy a lot of what they're about. It's really changing people's habits. It's changing industry, the food industry. I find the facts that your organization gotdrought.com has provided really fascinating. You say save 1300 gallons of water and being in California we have a drought. Now there are many ways to save that 1300 gallons of water. Don't flush your toilet for six months. I don't think people are going to take that <laughs> suggestion. It says don't take a shower for three months. I don't think people will take that suggestion. And then you say for lunch today don't eat one burger. Are you implying that one burger uses 1,300 gallons of water? Yes, yes we are. I did a lot of research into those numbers and I get a lot of questions about those numbers. Like people are very shocked because most of the media reports that a hamburger is like 660 gallons of water and I'm saying it's probably double that in California. It's a lot of water, whatever study one looks at. Right. It, even the cheese omelet uses 600 gallons of water apparently. Right. Because what we're basically talking about is water for the plants that exactly. feed the animals, water that feeds the animal, that the animals use to drink, the water for cleaning, the processing, processing of the yeah. meat. Exactly. So it's counting everything. Everything, even the packaging, which people don't think about. Uh, meat has to be packaged a certain way, and uh, the way it's packaged with so much plastic takes a lot of water. The packaging itself takes a lot of water. The transportation of the meat from one you know, state to another requires petrol, which is water. So there's a lot of things that go into these numbers that people don't think about. They think, well, no, a cow can't drink that much water. It's not just the drinking water. And what we feed cows in California is alfalfa, which is the most water intensive crop of any crop that you can grow. And we're feeding that to cows. And we know that we can feed more people if we go to a plant-based diet. Right. And that's important, particularly around the world where people need the food. You have another right. statistic here. 47% of California's water use is linked to the production of meat and animal products like eggs, cheese, and milk. In California yes. alone, 15.2 million acre feet per year are used for animal feed, whereas less than... 2 million acre feet per year for oranges. <laughs> right. Fruits and vegetables, right. Yeah, we are one of the top producing meat 
producing states. We're also the second largest dairy producer, which is a lot, a lot, a lot of water goes into um, dairy. We have another billboard that is about that. That's a, a thousand gallons of water goes into one gallon of milk. So it's ridiculous when you think about how much we're wasting and by feeding this to animals and then killing the animals instead of growing food that everyone can eat, you know, fruits, vegetables, grains. Basically, we have enough land, we have enough water to grow enough food to stop starvation. Everyone could eat, but we can't because we use a third of the world's land mass goes to animal agriculture. 55% of the world's water goes to animal agriculture. Not only the devastating effects that it has on water pollution, air pollution, animal agriculture has a 18% greenhouse gas emissions that's larger than all of transportation put together. So we're not really looking at those issues when we talk about CO2, climate change, and they, they focus on the cars, but we could... They're missing about half of the major production of the gases that are causing right. global warming and the land use issues, the water issues, the humane issues of treating animals or how we treat them or don't treat them. And, and the factory workers who work in factory farms are notoriously mistreated. Um, they did it undercover on Tyson where people were wearing diapers on the assembly line because they weren't given bathroom breaks. So, you know, this is not just animals that are being tortured systematically. It's people too. And there's a whole slave trade and, and fishing. Where it's really it's sad really, to call them farms because right, they really are factories that right. have live animals in them. They're not letting the animals go out, roam, range free. But I hear even some of the range free animals are not necessarily the best to use. They're not always being treated fairly. No, a lot of range-free chickens, I know especially in the UK, are kept in cages. It's just their cages are a little bigger so they can actually turn around you know instead of being stuck in one place the whole time so they're trying to get consumers to not feel guilty about eating animals and I think that is a major issue that people feel really bad I think people are getting more and more informed and they know that it's not right and it's not sustainable it's hurting the environment, it's hurting ourselves, it hurts our health, it hurts animals, it hurts people, it hurts everybody. And that's why you have that billboard campaign to educate the public as we drive along to get more information if we're not getting it directly from organizations like yours. Right. But let's talk about your art because I am looking at some beautiful, colorful pictures that you have painted and it's interesting where you're taking primarily <laughs> animals' heads, putting them onto traditional Hindu, Buddhist types of religious prayer sculptures <laughs> or positions of figures used in those religions. And of course, we know in the Hindu tradition and many of the Buddhist tradition, they don't eat animals. Yeah. The thing I love about Buddhism and Hinduism that I fell in love with was their seeing the world as everything is connected and you know all the animals are connected and and a lot of Hindu you know they have Ganesha they have the elephant god which I've recreated um, because I love that combination of human and animal well we are animals. G. Valcher is a very um, well-known political artist said like all humans are animals, but some animals are more human than others. And I, I thought that was a great quote because I, I really feel like animals are sentient beings and I'm trying to elevate them to a status of deity, of God, of goddess. I think um, you've chosen some dog heads, pig heads <laughs> on what looks like Buddha praying. Right. Well, it started as a Buddha cat that I did. I lost a cat, and he was my best friend and soulmate, and I made a Buddha cat. Then I decided to call my publishing company Buddha Cat Press in honor of him. And then I was thinking, you know, well, I love pigs, and I love other animals that other people would never see as, you know, everyone loved the Buddha cat, but I did a Buddha pig because I thought, well, Cat, pig, doesn't matter, right? They're all animals. They're intelligent animals. And right. obviously, many of them, like the cats and dogs, 
love to be in companionship with human beings and we have a few of your pets around <laughs> us right now. You also do some other interesting art that's more on the political realm. You have a Hummer on what looks like a dinosaur figure. Right. And polar bears dead. Explain that one. <laughs> it's my Hummer Saurus Rex. Before I started doing animals as deities, I was doing a lot of really hard-hitting political artwork and I have these kind of series of monster things that I did once over there. It's called Petrolicon and it's a tank of gasoline that has a head like a welding mask on but it's like it's turned into this monster and the arms are the gas pumps and so after that I, I had this dream. I was actually in Italy and I had this dream, like this vision of a Hummer and a dinosaur combined. Because, you know, all of our oil comes from dinosaurs, right? And dinosaurs went extinct. And this is like the next big extinction, but it's with Hummers, with Hummersaurs. So it's like the new monster is was, to me, fossil fuels. And that was right before I started getting into veganism really heavily. Yeah, I have the polar bears being attacked by this Hummosaurus. So the polar bears are dying. It's a very sad, sad scene. But people love that print. I think because everything I do has happy colors and it looks like it should be happy or something. Indeed, <laughs> I'm looking at some very colorful <laughs> figures, whether or not it's a pleasant picture of an animal being in a more spiritual place or whether or not it's a political statement and your exhibition's chair for the Los Angeles Printmaking Society, so you do make prints of some of your art so people right. can obtain them if they don't get the original drawing. You are also a participating artist with the Art of Compassion Project, which is an international group of vegan artists. Right. Have you found that people in other countries are adopting this kind of diet, this approach to changing our behavior and attitude because I travel around the world and many traditional diets are very heavy meat animal oriented. Yeah, there's something that I wish I knew about gut drought too is what kind of effect these things have. I can only hope that they do change people's minds. I know I do get emails from time to time and people say, oh you made me turn vegan or you made me stop and eat a salad instead of a hamburger tonight and those are like I think little things that we have an effect on. Who is leading the effort? Americans okay. or other people in other countries? Well, I think it's interesting, the Art and Compassion Project. So we're a group of vegan artists, and what we're promoting is veganism, basically, and compassion. It's called the Art of Compassion. So it's about showing compassion for all living things, basically. And then that we do that through our art, and we show. We were in Veggie Fest in Paris. We have a calendar that we put out every year. And we put these place cards in restaurants, you know, thanking people for ordering vegan food, like little things like that. I was surprised like our project, this little group has grown and it keeps growing because there's so many people doing this type of art and who care about the environment so much and are waking up. And I think that the more that art gets out there, the more mainstream it becomes, then you'll really see an impact. But I, I believe millennials are eating less meat. More millennials now are vegan. I think it's twice or three times the amount of vegans in the last 10 years, 20 years. So I think it's growing and, and as things come more mainstream, like plant-based foods like Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burger and Chow Cheese, people start warming up to the idea that it's not just a fringe movement, it's something that's normal. We are definitely seeing a change and more and more people adopting a different lifestyle. As an artist, what is the easiest animal to draw, paint? <laughs> What's the hardest one? Which one do you enjoy the most? Wow, that's a really hard question. Certain animals are harder, I think, to make into humanoid forms. I don't want to say human, anthropomorphic. Adding the animal head to right. a human figure. Right, like sometimes like, I want to do a bird, but it's hard to get a bird because from the front, they don't look like much. You know, you have to get it from the side. And I've been trying to do like something with a goat for a while, but... It's hard when certain animals have certain connotations too, I think, you know, like the pig. Like I put this up on the street, I had a mural up. And, and what you're talking about is uh, a, a my Buddha pig. big 
pig <laughs> with the Buddha symbol hand yeah. and a beautiful tree, colorful tree behind it. But in this society, pigs are just treated as an animal to eat, and yet they are very intelligent. And I've right. read studies where they can be trained like dogs. Yeah, they're the fourth or fifth smartest animals. They're smarter than dogs. Unfortunately, they get a bad rap. Like, you're a pig, or, you know, cops yes. are called pigs. Many, yeah. many different animals do have right. negative raps, whether many. or not they're snakes or, right. or pigs. And that's something, of course, you're working on changing. Yeah. I'd like to thank you so very much for sharing your beautiful artwork, thank your you. message for us to reduce our water consumption by changing our diets. Right. Thank you for thank being you. my guest. Thank you very much, Nancy. I have been speaking with Karen Fiorito. She is a vegan artist and activist. We'll be back in a moment with more ecological issues. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559-9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org.